Welcome to Horsepower Heritage. My name is Maurice Merrick, and today I have a fantastic guest. This gentleman is a freelance automotive journalist and producer. Um, he's written for Automobile, Wired, The Rob Report, and others. He's also the author of three books, Legendary Race Cars, Legendary Motorcycles, and one volume of the Speed Read series, Supercar. Bassem Wasef, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. How are you, buddy? Um, strange times we're living in. I'm doing, you know, I'm doing actually really well. This is a very big lifestyle adjustment for me. Um, I'm usually traveling quite a bit extensively all over the world. Um, usually one to two trips to Europe per month. Um, I'm gone probably 40% of the time. So being at home essentially 100% of the time is just like mind blowing to me. It's a totally different experience. I'm actually I know it's a really tough time for a lot of people, but I'm actually really getting a lot of good stuff out of this. So it's, it's been great so far. Well, I'm really pleased that we could set this up today. You know, my goal for the series has always been to have my guests in studio with me. And uh, I'm committed to that in the future. But for now, this is fantastic. And I just appreciate uh, you joining us. Um, it's great to be here, man. It, it strikes me, Bassam, that, you know, you get paid to do what most people would do for free. Yeah. So, you know, I never really envisioned this happening the way it happened. Um, I didn't plan this career. I was an English. I mean, I had kind of all the background going before I knew it, but um, the way it converged was very strange. Um, always been a car and motorcycle enthusiast. It's just been in my blood. You know, like my parents tell me that I used to sing happy birthday to my matchbox cars um, when I was really young. Uh, so that was always there. I used to read car magazines when I was a kid. Um, I was an English major at UCLA, but I always thought it was going to do something different. Um, and I was working in film and TV when I came across an opportunity to contribute to a local magazine in LA that was a high-end luxury magazine um, on cars uh, for their car column. And I thought, oh, that'd be a fun little side hobby. You know, I'll kind of just toy with that a little bit and do that. But it just snowballed. And when you're that attracted to the subject matter and the lifestyle and the things that go around it, um, I'll just never forget the first press trip that I went on. I just couldn't believe that I was surrounded by people who were so like-minded. I was meeting race car drivers. I was driving on a racetrack with them and getting tips from them in, in really fast cars. And I just could not resist it. I was like, I've got to do more of this. You know, It was like a drug. And yeah, that's got to be a pretty heady experience because I imagine, you know, you're thrust into this environment with some really heavy hitters yeah. and, and you're, you know, you're welcomed, uh, you're embraced by that community. Um, and, uh, there, it, the, I'm sure the learning curve is steep, but also just taking it all in, it must've been overwhelming. It's overwhelming and meeting a lot of your heroes and, you know, in kind of environments that are like, you only dreamed them, when, dreamed of them when you were a kid, you know? Um, being a Villa Dest on Lake Como, seeing these priceless cars roll out, just beautiful works of art, you know. I mean, I had been going to Pebble Beach for years on my own, on my own dime, and kind of feeling like you're on the outside looking in. And then when somebody invites you to stay at the lodge and hang out with Sterling Moss and, you know, take a helicopter ride over it all, and here's as much champagne as you want. You know, I remember, like, in college, like, gosh, do I really, can I do a $25 glass of champagne when I got to pay for gas on the way home, you know? <laughs> so just a totally different experience. So I never really take it for granted. I think that's kind of the upside, even though this job has its own challenges and um, it's not always easy. And especially in this climate now, things have changed so much, but you've got to remind yourself that, you know, this is what you dreamed of doing. And, um, you know, sometimes you think about the alternative and you're like, you know, okay, this is why I do it. Are there any particular challenges to writing in the automotive sphere? It's an interest, been an interesting process over the years. And it's been a different experience because um, I got to say it was easier for me in the beginning because I had gestated all these thoughts in my head for decades, literally, you know, and it's based on formative experiences and formative opinions and formative um, intake of material. So, you know, reading Automobile Magazine as a kid, reading Road and Track, Car and Driver, you build this sort of like inner vocabulary in your head. 
And um, cars are an interesting juncture of so many different factors because they're engineering, but they're also emotional, but they're also uh, visceral. It's, there's marketing in there. There's per preconceived notions. So I was full to the brim of stuff I wanted to say when I started in this career. Um, and I feel like I said a lot of that. So the challenge becomes, after you've been doing it a few years, how do I keep my voice fresh? You know, how do I say things that I haven't said before? How do I keep my kind of my um, verbal signature unique? And uh, that's that's a bit of a challenge, you know. And I think any writer faces that in any field. But cars are are their own kind of unique challenge because there's so many cliches out there. You know, you're always trying to go beyond the cliches. You're always trying to say things in new and interesting ways. And um, that gets harder the more you do it. It gets, you know, it gets to be a different kind of challenge. Absolutely. And there are so many publications out there now, um, not just print media, obviously, but uh, on the web. Um, just the sheer output, a, a, a lot of it, a lot of it is a little bit numbing when you read it. Obviously, you've been, you know, you've been an enthusiast uh, since you were a child, and I imagine that you kind of uh, were like a sponge even early on, soaking up technical details and and also probably learning from the the writing at that time. Absolutely. I mean, I grew up with a real sense of storytelling about cars. You know, I mean, of course, I love the nuts and bolts and the and the tech talk and, and what makes exceptional cars exceptional from an engineering standpoint. But, you know, I also grew up reading Peter Egan telling stories about, you know, interaction with machines and the predicaments they put you into and how people look at you when you're in these vehicles and all the kind of sociological things that come with these machines. Because, um, you know, it's easy to get into the appliance mindset when you're reviewing a car because there's so much stuff to talk about that's comparative to other things in its field and how does it perform and is it reliable and how's the fuel economy. But um, when you get past that, I think that's where it gets engaging, you know? I mean, that's why I like writing for a number of different outlets, many of which have a lifestyle angle that uh, looks at the big picture. You know, it looks not just about the nuts and bolts, but about what makes a vehicle trigger something that you can't necessarily capture in a spec sheet or something rational like that. Right. Yeah. By the way, I have sitting here on the desk a copy of Grand Prix Cars by Dennis Jenkinson. This is a, an original 1959 edition. Amazing. And um, I, I, you know, I was just reading uh, Jenks uh, on his, uh, his trip with Sterling Moss on the 55 yeah. Mil Amelia. And what a fantastic story that is. It's unbelievable. Um, you know, the record that will never be broken, um, partially because they just don't, uh, they can't hit those speeds now legally, and they don't close off the road in the same continuous way that they used to, to do the Mil Milia, um, for the course of essentially a full day of flat out driving. Uh, Jenks is an unsung hero for being able to manage the driver in a way that enabled full tilt driving, but being right on it and knowing what was coming up. And they spent a lot of time, the two of them, um, pre-routing the course, driving it, making detailed notes on the road, the turns, the, the degree of turns, the crest, what was over that blind hill. And it's, uh, it's just an amazing accomplishment. It's so epic. And uh, you could never do that today. Yeah, I think it's well known, you know, among enthusiasts, both Jenks and Moss, you know, ad admitted that they didn't think a non-Italian could win the Mille Miglia unless they applied some, some system management to the whole thing, if, uh, you know, for lack of a better term. And, and so you're right, they, they did that pre-run of the course and Jenks had all of his notes. And uh, you're, you're right, I mean, an amazing feat never to be repeated. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was lucky to do the Mille Miglia in 2018. And even, even with modern legal restrictions, there are a lot of exceptions that make you go, wow, I can't believe we just did that. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about that experience. What, what car were you in? Who, who were you with? And um, how did it go down? 
So I was um, sponsored by Mercedes Benz. I was in a 300 SL Gullwing. Uh, my co-driver was Sean Evans, fellow, uh, he's a colleague, automotive journalist. And, um, you know, when you break it down over several days, uh, it makes you really appreciate the fact that A, it's still exhausting, and B, uh, they did it all the way full tilt back in the day. Um, the car is phenomenal. Um, the engineering that they had in the mid 1950s that Mercedes Benz had was truly exceptional. And, you know, a lot of people don't think about the 300 SL as a supercar because all the flashy Lamborghinis and Ferraris tend to get the attention. But for its time, it was so advanced. It was just, it's even by modern standards, it's pretty remarkable. Um, now, what the Italian police do with this event is really special because if you're lucky enough to get a motorcycle cop because they have a lot of motorcycle escorts that take you through the course and clear the way for you and help you along, what they do is basically give you carte blanche as long as you follow them to just go like the wind. And they'll go around traffic and they'll wave you around and they'll stop you know, through intersections to let you through. And I remember this one particular stretch where we were just flying, we were going so fast. And they knew where the speed, speed traps were, so they wouldn't go through a, a speed camera at speed. But when you go, you know, an hour flat out following a motorcycle cop, and then we had this one where he finally slowed down and stopped near the checkpoint and said, you like? <laughs> <laughs> just this knowing like, yes, thank you. Yeah, the Italians are very special about speed. And, you know, seeing the, the recognition on the locals when you come into a village and you do, you slow down and the mayor does his little presentation and passes out things. And, you know, there's a whole like kind of dog and pony show aspect to it um, in these little towns. The kids and their enthusiasm and waving flags and going crazy. I mean, like, we need more of that in the world. I mean, there's so much unfriendliness towards the automobile these days in major, major cities, you know, closing off lanes of highways and banning vintage cars and eventually banning internal combustion cars. Uh, this is one of the true holdouts that's like a whole national embrace of the automobile. It's really inspirational. I wouldn't be the first to argue that motorsport is really the national sport of Italy. Um, it, it, it's always been a point of national pride uh, from day one of the automobile. And they have had some of the most incredible road races anywhere in the world. That experience, did it, was it almost like a, a time machine for you in a sense? It was one of the most time machine-y automotive experiences I've ever done because you're surrounded by a sea of cars from the period of right. all you know, all of that period, nothing modern. You do get a little bleed in the periphery, you know, pace cars and, you know, sometimes you're getting around traffic and whatever, but when you're chasing a 550 speed, uh, speedster, 550A, you know, down a windy road and it's just the two of you and there's a Ferrari behind you, you know, it's like, you do get this like, oh my God, this is, this is like a dream. Um, another though, another experience that was a real time travel for me was Goodwood Revival because that's a unique experience because you're on Lord March's premises and you're not allowed past the door if you're not wearing period clothes. So not only is everyone dressed in period, the buildings are period, all the vehicles are period, the motorcycles, the cars, there's spitfires flying above, you know, they've got reenactments of, uh, of like, you know, World War II radio uh, broadcasts and, and it's like an incredible experience. So England, too, has this like really deep appreciation for motorsports history that's still, still alive. Yeah, that fully immersive environment of Goodwood uh, is something that uh, I, I hope to experience for myself soon someday. You told us that during the Mille Miglia that you participated in, the car you were in was a 300 SL, and uh, you used the word supercar. And I agree with you 100%. I think it is the world's first supercar. Now, it, it could be argued that the Grand Prix Bugattis and Alphas of the 20s and 30s would fit the bill too. But let's not forget that those were race cars and the 300 SL 
was not simply a race car, but was also a road car. Yeah. And so I think that bona fide sort of, that makes it the first supercar in my book. And it did borrow uh, Grand Prix technology, which is really what made it, it stand out. Because anyone can build a road car based on previous road cars, but it's not until you trickle down from racing that you get something that's so much more capable. Um, modern example of that, um, Lamborghini for a long time was not taken seriously in performance circles because they were more about flash than they were about absolute performance, like something you would not, not be afraid to literally race on the track, not just take on a track day and have some fun with. But it wasn't until the current gen Uricon, in my opinion, that they really got a lot of GT3 technology into the car, into the, into the foundation of the car to make it competent on a racetrack. And, and it's that difference between driving at seven tenths or eight tenths on the road versus driving nine or 10 tenths on a racetrack that makes all the difference for me in terms of differentiation. Bassam, you came of age in the 1980s when really that was kind of, that was sort of a golden moment for supercars. Mm -hmm. Was that influential to you? I mean, I think we all had posters of a 911 Turbo or a late model Countach. 100%. Um, you know, it started with car magazines and seeing them on the cover of car magazines and reading about them. Um, and this sort of, it's like next level aspiration. It's like, I don't want to own a regular 911. I want the turbo, you know? I don't want a regular car. I want a Countach. And it's so fantastical, especially when your mind is young and developing. You're thinking of these things as like, these are alien spaceships. They're not even cars, you know? And um, that still, you know, gets me going still. But it's like something that really planted a seed in terms of looking beyond the, the immediate. Definitely. And, you know, to me, what's so cool about that time period is that, you know, we were coming out of the, the gas crisis of the 70s. And that Malays era of automobiles that, that uh, GM and Ford and Chrysler were building. And those are, mo you know, most American production cars from those years are totally forgettable. But that sort of supercar vibe or supercar aesthetic did trickle down. For example, the VW GTI or the Fox Body Mustang, those cars had a certain flash, a certain swagger Mm -hmm. that I think was influenced by cars like the Countach. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's um, when you think about a car maker and what they're selling, uh, you know, racing is a really hard financial proposition. Um, but when you talk about an image of a, of a race car and an image of a street car, what it stands to inherit is so great. Um, VW Group, I think, has done a really good job of completely immersing in racing. You know, Bentley races now, um, Audi races, Audi, well, until recently was, was racing at the very highest level uh, of endurance racing. Um, Lamborghini, uh, you know, all of this stuff is really important for a brand, even if it doesn't make money, because you've got to prove that you're serious. You know, you're not just a luxury brand, you're a luxury perform performance brand. And something's got to stoke that desire because there's so much good stuff out there. You know, Ferrari's been doing it forever. Porsche's been doing it forever. Um, and that's the challenge, I think, that newer brands face. You know, like Genesis is a great luxury brand, but the heritage is just a couple years old. You know, it's five years old, maybe. Um, so how do they prove themselves? You know, how do they get out there? They've got to do something to legitimize um, who they are, what their brand DNA is, and define that. And it takes time. It takes decades. And, you know, the, the old cliche is that racing improves the breed, but it's really true. Absolutely. So, Bassam, you, am I right, you grew up in London? Uh, Until I was six years old, yeah. Oh, and just jumping back to that, that racing thing, I'm looking at the GT40 behind you. Oh, yeah. And, you know, that's the ultimate example, right? Like Ford was selling cars back then, but they just weren't cool. And Absolutely. The way to legitimize the brand was to go to Le Mans and beat Ferrari. I mean, it's, I love the story because it's so elemental. It's so kind of like primal in a way. It's like the David and Goliath story, you know? And uh, we can't beat Ferrari. We, get, we can't buy Ferrari. We're going to beat him on the racetrack. 
I just, I love that. Bassam, tell me about your first gig. I will never forget my first assignment. So Brentwood Magazine, which is a local or was a local uh, luxury magazine in Los Angeles, um, had an ad out for an automotive writer. And uh, I contacted them and I said, hey, you know, I'd love to write for you guys. And they said, well, do you have any samples of your work? And I said, well, no, not for automotive, but I can write something just to show you what I know what I'm talking about. So I wrote a little spec one-off piece and uh, the editor saw that I could, I knew a thing or two about cars and said, okay, sure. Why don't you write a, uh, for a summer issue about convertibles, high-end convertibles. Um, find four really nice convertibles and write a little piece about them. So I cold called all the manufacturers I could and literally within about a week and a half, I had a Maserati Spider, I had a Porsche 911 Cabriolet, I had an AMG, SL AMG 55, um, and I had a Aston Martin DB9 or DB7 Volante in my garage. <laughs> so, That's a pretty quick well, hookup. I went from zero to drug dealer basically overnight. <laughs> All my neighbors are like, what's going on here? And uh, I wrote the piece and it, and, and it did great and they liked it and they asked for more. So Porsche calls me up and says, hey, uh, we're doing the launch of the uh, 911 GT3 at Virginia National Raceway. Uh, do you wanna come test the car and write about it? And I'll never forget this. I said, I'd love to, let me just call my editor to make sure that they can pay for me to get there. And the guy <laughs> on the other line, the late great Bob Carlson, said, oh, we'll take care of that, don't worry. <laughs> I'm like, oh, you're gonna pay for, oh, wow, okay, cool, I'm in. Wow, that's how great. this works, yeah. This is how this business works, yeah, it was amazing. Count me in, right? Exactly, I can do that. <laughs> Bassam, you're also an avid motorcyclist. Absolutely, yeah, love bikes. Is, is there a particular kind of bike or kind of riding that you like or? You know, I do, I mean, in a way, it's all good, but I gravitate towards bikes with an extra dose of soul, if you will. There's something about Italian bikes. Me, like, you know, I love a good Italian bike. They've got just so much personality. Not to say that there isn't something great about riding uh, BMW GS off-road, because it's really good at that. Um, or a Japanese bike on a racetrack because they're really good at that. But Italian bikes just speak to me because there is an intent that's so clear in the way that they're built. Um, and they're so involving emotionally. And to me, like if you're not emotionally invested in a motorcycle, like what's the point, right? Like you may as well just get in a car, you'll get air conditioning and safety and all the other things that, that come with being in a car. Um, but like, you know, the MV Augustas, the Ducatis in particular, I just, they really reverberate with me, you know, and, and riding a motorcycle is such an individual experience. Um, you're literally wrapping your body around the machine. So you, you're, you're got to be at one with it. And if you're not exactly at one, at least you're interacting with it in a way that is involving. But when you're uncomfortable on a bike, it's the worst. Um, whether that's the exterior conditions or whether you're freezing or it's too hot or you just don't fit right and your, your wrists are cramping because the ergonomics are off, you know, riding is a very all or nothing process, but when it, when it works, it's so good. I totally agree with you. And, and I've said this before, but I think motorcycling is one of those things that is so healing in terms of your mental focus and everything, because you really are, that's all you care about at the moment. And so you can empty your mind. You have to empty your mind. There's no, <laughs> there's no multitasking. There's no distractions. And, you know, I mean, I have written listening to music on Bluetooth. I have taken calls on Bluetooth. You know, there are things that you can be doing. You can be glancing down at a GPS, but in its purest essence, I think it's just you, the machine on the road. Like, that's the way it really ought to be. Are you a solo rider or do you r ride with friends or does it matter? I enjoy solo riding for that, that mind clearing process and experience. Um, and I do ride with friends that I trust, um, but you have to trust them because there's so much that can go wrong out there. And, um, you know, and if there's somebody I'm riding with that feels 
like 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 I haven't ridden with them before and they feel like they've really got to be in front, go in front. You know, I'd rather ride at my own pace um, and feel comfortable than feel like it's a competition, you know, dicing on the road. Hey, let's talk about criticism in, in automotive riding. Is it tough to be a critic? Is it, is it tough to be objective? Um, do you feel pressure to censor yourself at times? a really good question um you know the way the industry works is sort of unlike any other in that in order to get access to these vehicles um at an early point in the vehicle's lifespan um the numbers are stacked against you um especially if it's a really desirable machine uh, if they're choose if a car manufacturer is choosing 12 people to go to the long lead of a car that won't be available again for another three months in the States. They're going to pick those dozen people very carefully. Um, it's just numbers. It's a numbers game. You know, if they're going to fly you to the Nürburgring to drive, you know, the hot new number on the racetrack, um, you're probably part of a small group of people. Um, and that said, uh, it puts pressure on you. Um, there is an unspoken pressure of like, you know, we did all this for you, you know, but the bottom line is you've got to be honest. Um, you've got to really be objective in your opinions and you've got to remove all the great hotel that you stay at from your head and the great dinners and the great drinks and the whole, all the stuff that comes with it and focus on the car. That's the bottom line. You're there for the car, you know? And sure, there's a lot of there's a lot of side stuff that gets thrown into the mix. But at the end of the day, you're there to give an honest opinion about the car. Um, now, the great thing about the way the industry is now um, that we didn't have in the print only era is that reviews get posted online, and you can cross reference um, opinions so quickly that. Um, it almost, in a way, is a way of keeping people honest, you know. Um, I feel like if I don't talk about a car's flaws, I'm doing a disservice to the person that's going to go plunk down a huge amount of money on this machine, you know. Um, if there's something that doesn't feel right, even though you'd think it would feel right, you know, if it's a $150,000 car, but there's a piece of plastic on the steering wheel that touches your hand and you're like, why is this here on this expensive car? I mean, I feel it's a duty to bring that up. Um, and then there's layers to that, of course. It's not just, you know, your impressions on the physical things. It's like, is this car really worthwhile? Why are they, why are they still building this car? You know, why does it exist? Decades ago, it was not difficult to identify flaws in a car. I mean, we're, we're talking about a time when, let's say, for instance, the period where disc brakes were a new thing or ABS was a new thing or, or some cars just didn't have power steering. Chassis design, uh, uh, body on frame versus unibody. These differences were very significant at one point in, in history. And now the engineering and the manufacturing is so tight across the, the spectrum. So really the, the differences are, are a hair's width at times, wouldn't you say? Oh, it's totally true. Um, not only are cars exponentially better now, exponentially more reliable, better built, higher performance. I mean, we live in an age where 500 horsepower, $40,000 cars are commonplace, $50,000 cars are commonplace. Um, but beyond that, think about how many genres there are now. I mean, you look at car makers before and they used to build, you know, an entry level car, maybe a midsize uh, sedan and then, you know, a bigger sedan that was higher end, uh, maybe a sports car. But now we've got, you know, SUVs that are ultra high performance that they call coupes because they're a little bit sleeker, but they're crossovers because they're more car like and you get parsed into all these tiny little segments. And uh, I think that's really where car makers are differentiating themselves now. It's like, who are we? What's the core of our brand? And um, how do we do what we do well? Because you can go out and buy, you know, an almost carbon copied version of this car from another car maker. 
So where does our differentiation come in? You know, where does our brand DNA make us feel like a different car? It's easy to get deceived by the, the commonly stated uh, belief that all cars look the same now. Um, you know, yeah, sure, it might be true um, because of bumper height regulations and crumple zones and all that stuff. But I think the real differentiator now is behind the wheel and in the cabin and what, what you see, touch, and feel that makes you feel like you're in something that's special. It's hilarious to me that we've reached a point in automotive development where car makers are actually trying to inject a mechanical visceral feel back into the machine because they've become so seamless and so, you know, tech heavy. Absolutely. I mean, look at the Bugatti Veyron. Um, on paper, like when I was a kid, if I saw that a car had 16 cylinders and produced over a thousand horsepower, I, I wouldn't have believed it. It just sounds like sci-fi. Like, oh yeah, make up a number. That's insane. And yet the biggest criticism for that car was that it just didn't hit you here. Like it was so good at what it was doing, you know, you could do 200 and whatever, 60 miles an hour. And uh, it just wasn't uh, making the driver feel connected to the machine. So that aspect of cars is really fascinating to me. The um, engineering required to bring emotion into the experience. Um, I think it was the uh, 488 Pista. It was at the launch of the 488 Pista and Ferrari was talking about how they introduced a pulse of energy during the gear transfer to make the gear changes feel more emotional. And they didn't, you know, it took them a long time to admit that that's what it was, what it was. But um, the idea that they're almost it's like the difference between listening to a compact disc and an LP. It's like on paper, the CD should be far superior because it's a perfect reproduction. It's ones and zeros and it's the same every time. But what makes an LP sound good is the fuzziness. It's the imperfection. It's the, um, it's the flutter sometimes. There's all these kind of audiophile terms to describe the, 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 the magic of analog and how that helps the sound. And, um, you know, Engineering is your friend, but it's also can be your enemy, I think, um, especially when you're chasing numbers. And uh, a number of car makers have uh, admitted that uh, they hit a certain zero to 60 number to make the headlines, you know, to make the comparison, uh, the Comparo test between other sports cars so that they can win. And it's not necessarily the best for the car's character. Um, so there's this weird kind of duality in, in automotive uh, engineering and, and marketing as well um, to grab people because honestly at the end of the day it's it's really simple it's like there's the car and there's what people are saying about the car and it could be the best car in the world but if nobody says it or acknowledges it it's almost like it doesn't matter you know um, that's why fans are really important that's why forums are important um, and that's why journalism is important to put these things into context I think your comparison with uh, digital audio versus analog LPs is perfect. I know that I recall the debate over compact disc sound, um, and I'm sure you remember that too. A lot of people said it's cold and lifeless versus an LP, and no thank you. Absolutely, yeah. And there are plenty of automobiles that are packed with tech and very well engineered, but they leave you cold. Um, I mean, that's why the more I drive stuff, the more I prefer older stuff, to be honest. Um, you can go out and spend big chunks of money on a car that's got all-wheel drive and launch control and um, torque vectoring to get you through the corner and you know everything that, that on paper makes you a faster driver, but um, you've got to be going 200 miles an hour to feel something, you know, and I... I, I used to have I've had a couple of air cooled Porsches that I loved, and I've got a Series Two A Land Rover that that I adore. And um, I mean, maybe part of that is because I get access to really fast stuff, and I get that out of my system, and I get to enjoy nice, perfect cars. But for me, it's like I'm in less of a hurry now than I used to be <laughs> to get from A to B, and I don't want more speeding tickets. So, you know, there's something about the interaction with a machine that's really something reassuring about it. All right, Bassam, we're gonna take a quick break, but we will be right back with more. Sounds good. 